Uh, the rising outrage to Saudi spending, is it coming from a position of threat from those who are shouting the loudest despite buying gold from boxing? Is it impossible for the Saudis to truly take a hold of football? If not, why is there more pushback than ever before? Yesterday, Gary Neville saying the Premier League should put in an instant embargo on transfers to Saudi Arabia to ensure the integrity of the game isn't being damaged. Checks should be made on the appropriateness of the transactions. If it comes through that process, obviously transfers could open up again. But I do believe at this moment in time, transfers should be halted until you look into the ownership structure at Chelsea and whether there are beneficial transfer dealings that are improper. Jamie Carragher weighed in a little bit later on in the day saying Bernardo Silva in his peak years and has been one of the best players in Europe for the last five years. I wasn't worried about the Saudi league taking players in their 30s. A touch worried with players below the elite, Neves. But if this happens, Silva goes there. It feels like a game changer. Mm. Saudi has taken over golf, the big boxing fights, and now they want to take over football. This sports washing needs to be stopped. And he uh, tagged in the Premier League and UEFA. Can you understand the concern? To a degree. It's interesting to listen to Gary Neville being all apotropaic in his thinking. Um, and being motivated by, oh, not, you know, I'm going to have to Google that, warding off evil influences, right. um, and 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 looking at the reality of what Saudi could be and what it is being, the main thrust is not necessarily about them buying UEFA or buying the Premier League or the FA because there's a different construct to football than there is to golf, and they have bought golf. Let's be clear, but they will have their challenges. Uh, in America because they're not just going to be able to get past this because there is real resistance in America to nation states of some shape or form owning American assets. Two Senate committees have been set up. Of course they have and they will want to push back against it because there's political capital in this because mm. there's a relationship between America and Saudi Arabia isn't at its greatest. We're going to do that a little right. bit later on actually. Right. So so the reality of that is is one thing but the, di the difficulty is is that when you, the link has been made by very clever people looking at the fact that the, uh, that the PIF fund are involved with Clear Lake, which is the vehicle that has been used, the private equity fund, which was used by Todd Bowley to buy Chelsea. Mm. And that then means that ultimately Chelsea have an opportunity to find a way out of their so-called financial fair pay problems that are impending as a result of their profligacy via Todd Bowley, who of course would have not priced in the fact that he's got an immeasurable amount of assets that he can sell to balance off the depreciation that he'll have from the players that he's bought. Why do you think that's not happening? Why do I think what, what's not happening? Why do you think that, it, that Chelsea because, haven't got FFP problems and that the Because I just told you, because they've got an embarrassment of riches of players that are ultimately on their balance sheet carrying no value to their balance sheet, like Mason Mount, like Callum Hudson Odoi, like Ruben Loftus Cheek, that the moment they flick the switch on those boys and sell them for 120 million combined, that 120 million will go straight to profit. So and Havertz will... yesterday being sold, 37 million was an FFP profit, 13.5 million pounds a year in wages have been saved. Kovacic, 22 yeah. million pounds profit. What was, Havertz, point... what was Havertz bought for? Uh, about seventy-two million plus add-on. So how, long about he, how long has he been there? Three years. Right. So, he, and how long was his contract? Four years. Uh, five. Right. So his so his so his value on Chelsea's balance sheet would be about twenty-eight million quid. Well, I so think thirty-seven million is the profit for FFP. I'm just going for the, sure. the FFP if profit if, figures. If, if, if the numbers are yeah, actually you're right. If it's over sixty-five million quid. The profit would be thirty-seven million quid. Yeah. So that you then go and sell Callum Hudson Odoi. You then go and sell Mason Mount. That's got no carrying value on their balance sheet. All of a sudden, you've got straight to profit transactions of one hundred and fifty million quid. There and thereabouts, right? And then if you buy players in on, on eight-year deals, you're carrying extra depreciation. If they bought 600 million pounds of players last year and they took them all on eight-year deals, their depreciation number on top of their already existing number is about 75 million pounds a season. They can structure this through. They can structure it through. Now, what would, have, would not have helped them is they probably lost 20 million quid in placings in the Premier League as a result of being so far down the pyramid that they never budgeted for. And they probably also lost another 30 or 40 million out of reasonable budgets for, from competing in the Champions League. So they've got, some, they've got some inches and some yards. Now, the accusation is this. Is that so, this... so you're saying it shouldn't be looked at? Well, it'll come out in the wash, won't it? Now, what the, argue, what the accusation is this. It comes from this particular tree, this poisonous tree, which is that the PIF fund has invested in Clear Lake. And Clear Lake was the private equity vehicle that Todd Bowley used to buy Chelsea. One, now, the, the one of them, because there's other people that are investing in it as well, isn't it? private equity. Private equity is made up of a whole group of different individuals that provide the cash to be to be invested into different propositions, whether it's tech businesses or, in this instance, a football-related business. So what we what we what the PIF have done is they've invested lots and lots of money, as a sovereign wealth fund would do, with private equity players that give good returns. And in previous indications, they've bought tech businesses, and now the link has been made that because they invested before, naturally, one of two things happened. Maybe some of that dough funded by Chelsea. 
or maybe there's an element of opportunity because of the nature of the relationship that Chelsea getting out from underneath uh, a financial fair play problem and being able to get rid of their old tat for decent re relative re uh, returns for them mm. is a constructed e exercise between an investor in a private equity fund who happens to be a nation state, who happens to be involved in football, who happens to be potentially a partner of Chelsea's. Now, these are all reasonable assumptions, but they're smoking they're smoking guns. They're not necessarily fired bullets. I, I, so, so do you understand then why Gary Neville says we should halt transfers to Saudi Arabia until we find out for sure exactly what the relationship no, is? No, because Gary Neville's appealing to a gallery. And Lester, if we're talking about players, put aside the salaries, right? Because because ultimately the salaries are the construct of what Saudi want to do with those players, and we can we can't talk about that. But we've got to talk about the inherent value of players. If these players are being sold for values that are not market valued, so inflated prices. Well, then you can maybe maybe yeah. you've got an argument. Well, there. for example, Koulibaly they're going to make a six point seven million pound loss on, but they're okay. going to save thirteen and a half million pounds in wages. Fine, but there's no indication they couldn't get rid of him somewhere else. There's no indication they couldn't trade him somewhere else and take up a portion of those wages. Uh, then, listen, they might have to take some of his wages, <laughs> but if they've got thirty, I don't know what his wage, what his wages are. What are his wages? Fifteen million quid a year. Roughly, I would have thought. Right. Well, yeah. if they if, if Chelsea were doing a trade situation and they had to get rid of him, they could only get rid of seven and a half million pounds of his wages. They'd have seven and a half million pounds more. They'll do their economics. Don't be, but don't believe that a private equity guy that has made more money than we can ever imagine in our lives hasn't had an actual in looking at every single possibility and reality of what they need to do to be able to make sure they adhere. So to is this just clever with. accounting from Chelsea and clever? Uh, but what's uh, clever about it? Why is it clever from Chelsea? Chelsea, well, a window, well, a all right, clever in terms of the way that what they're doing now is is they're maximising the value of getting these players up they've re realized an a market opportunity. has opened up yeah a market has opened up in the same way that the chinese market and they've exploited up. it and they're in a position to have players that are billable and bankable as far as the saudis are concerned and ultimately the saudis have got more money than than than, than they should be allowed to have to spend on football because no one's looking at saudi what do you mean by should be allowed to have well they're a disruptor now I'm all I'm all for the belief that when someone buys a football club, they shouldn't be governed by financial fair play for the first couple of years because they should be able to invest a little bit more yeah. than the average person that's had a football club for a period of time. Because so by got, that pre premise, so why shouldn't they be allowed to invest as much so as they want for the next point. couple of years? So I was about to then translate that into owning the Saudis and saying that they should have a period of time, a period of grace to be able to develop their football. They can't do it naturally because they're massively behind the curve. Mm. They're massively behind the ecosystem of football. And if they're trying to catch up with European football and, and whatever other football we think is competitive, they're going to be 20, 30 years to do that. Some would say, well, that's the natural order. Other would say, why should they have to? So why aren't they given a, a period of time where they're allowed to invest in their leagues and then some form of overall football governance steps in and says, right, that's enough now. What you're doing is you're disrupting the ecosystem. You're being used as a stalking horse to drive the price up for every other league because every agent worth his salts, and I don't use that term particularly favourably, will be saying, Mainly let's, use, <laughs> let's use Saudi as a benchmark because we can go and get him over there. And, and, and there will be a stop. There will be a stop to this preposterous level, but there still will be... Above the above the real relative value of players, if we can use that expression in construction with football players, because at this moment in time they're being thrown a hundred million pounds a year, and and that's absolutely absurd. They will drop down to a different level sooner rather than later, but even that will be an inflated level that will, will cause hyperinflation in football. Will then have an impact upon every pyramid system in every league, and that's the danger. Now, of course, the other accusation is. And Gary Neville's got no beans and no reason to be involved in this particular process about sports washing, if that's come out of his trap. That was, he was, uh, he was Jamie the first Carragher. one across, first one across the Carragher. Qatar to take um, the Reals or whatever it is. This Reals is the currency. No, and Jamie, that, Carragher, ja Jamie Carragher said this, is, this sports washing needs to be stopped. Is it sports washing? Um, it depends what Jamie thinks he means by sports washing. If he's talking about the top line perspective of the fact that by taking recognisable, identifiable, valuable brands if you want to call a football club a brand for the purpose of this conversation that are very much aspirational and are indexed into society and have legitimacy attached to them then you can deflect away from the ownership's actual behavior on human rights issues and start to legitimize them more in the thinking if you've got an owner that's saudi arabian uh, and that's done wonderful things for the community and you'll have a different attitude towards maybe well i don't like the way they look after the human rights i'm not going to fly there for a tourism uh, venture i don't want to go to dubai anytime soon but do I you i mean do you really think that owning it. a football club is going to change the the, the public's perception yeah about of course it is because saudi arabia fo football, con football contains great influence what it also does it, it opens doors and it opens and creates situations where you're engaged Is that more. the real sports washing, well, the it, access? Well, yes, of course it is. It's part of it. I mean, the, the, the greater commodity and value 
is the the ability to be able to leverage sport into an opportunity to make commercial inroads into discussions and relationships and access that you wouldn't have elsewhere. Because what they are really after, and what most people are after in positions of authority, great wealth and influence, is influence and power. And soft power is being able to have influence that no one actually sees or understands. And of course these countries are looking at, look at the way that they've acquired um, um, uh, Newcastle, for example, they've acquired for a sovereign wealth fund that has six hundred and fifty billion pounds, uh, dollars, sorry, under management, whose sole focus in life is to enrich the state and to be able to make sure that the state can insulate itself against any reduction in fossil fuels being needed in the world's scenario, or the fact that they want to have other revenue streams to their to their bow. They don't just want to rely on what's under their sand. And when we talk about the level of wealth that these countries have, I don't think anyone has an iota of understanding of the level that these of money. When we're talking in this country, we have billions of pounds of balance of deficit. They have trillions of pounds of excess cash. Mm. So it's just absolutely astronomical. And they have, like, and we mad have to, plans and for... Where I will agree with the Chuckle Brothers is that we do have to... Neville and Carragher. Oh, right. Is that we do have to keep an eye on this within the confines of sports. And society ha, as well. Ha, ha, well but, then again, but then again, look at it. No one's complaining about when they send their 240-character tweet out that the Saudis have invested in that particular business. No one, when they put their head down on a pillow in London that's owned by the Saudis, oh, I mustn't go here because of... It's going to point that out. I mean, they're no longer... I don't, think, by a I don't think they own a, a proportion of Twitter anymore because um, Elon Musk bought the oh, whole did. thing out. Yes, they, they do. They, they, he, they, they no, certainly no, 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 no. did. No, he does. Part of the they, still, they still own it Of course it he did. Where do you think he got the funding from? He didn't write a check out for £45 billion. He went and got the funding from a variety of different partners. And one of them were Middle Eastern, un- they, undoubtedly. They, they, were, they were involved prior to it. Then they had a, they had they a 22% were. share in yeah. uh, The PIF and, and, had 22% and, and share in Twitter. And someone else back in and taken a different share and done some of the funding because, t- because like in every every business, besides football, and this other notion that people have, have sort of lighted upon, that leverage buyouts have been taken out of football, they haven't. You can still buy a football club with other people's money. you just got to get the ratios right. And that you'd still, they'd still be allowed a Man United purchase with debt loaded into it because you'd only allow a ratio. But they're right to highlight one point. But if you pressed Jamie Carragher, and if you pressed, and I like Jamie, not so enamoured with Gary, but if you pressed these two but both guys... Both of them are, uh, have got football at their heart, haven't they? Yes, but it's all good, it's all good making a lot of noise. It's, you've got to have a little bit of substance behind well, someone's it. someone's got to make a lot of noise about yeah, it. Yeah, there's noise carriers, and then there's people that actually execute the real outcomes. And the bottom line is, is that, that, that this noise should have been much louder much louder before the Saudis were let him through the door. Because let's be honest about it, it is preposterous what's gone on with the PIF fund being able to buy Newcastle under the guise of... But that was delayed for a very long time because of the fact that people made a lot of noise. No, it was delayed. It was not. That's not true. It was delayed because of piracy. Because the Be Out Q, which was broadcasting from Saudi, was hijacking BN Signal and broadcasting and they didn't do anything about it. And the moment, the moment... But that was noise. No, well, we were it, talking no, that was, about that. That was the Premier League. And the, the noise was to the polar opposite. The bigger noise was coming out of Newcastle. The bigger noise was coming out of Mike Ashley. The bigger noise was coming out of MPs asking Boris Johnson to explain why this this football club wasn't being able to be bought. But the human rights stuff was discussed as well. But it will always be discussed. Human rights will always come uh, and be discussed by people. But the point is, is I'm talking about individuals that we collect and collate with noise, um, that actually when it comes down to it, the same individuals that tell the football fans to mobilise on their football club. You mean there was Language no noise about the, the future of football when we brought yeah. them into the fold? Yeah, and, 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 it's, and it's a popular hobby horse right now. Look behind the detail. I think that... Well, I think it's just panic, isn't it? It's about people, everyone's thinking, actually, this is this is our product and we're used to having it to ourselves. Yeah. And maybe there is a little bit of fear about the fact that somebody else is taking... Well, the possibly yeah, all that, the best players. That's the away. very thing that we that we don't like about. That's the very thing that Man City fans will say. It's protectionism. It's maintaining the elite. It's, it's looking after the cartel. That's what they would say. Football has done, and that's why football has this snooty, sneery attitude towards Man City. That you're just a manufactured club, um, and 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 people will have that attitude. I don't have that attitude. I have an attitude that they have breached rules and they need to be accountable for it. And if they haven't, clear themselves up. But the point is this, or clear the allegations up and do it in an irrefutable fashion. But in this instance, you, the, the, the reasons why these football clubs, they're not buying football clubs because they like wandering around the King's Road. You didn't get a Russian oligarch buying a football club because he liked sashaying up the new King's Road. Or they, you don't get a Middle Eastern investment into Newcastle because they wanted to stand on the Gallow Gate. And you don't get people buying Manchester City because they like Moss Side. They know that there's huge influence with this juggernaut. Think about it. Manchester United is recognisable around the globe, right? But its turnover is 500 million quid. That's an SME. That's not a big business in economic terms, but in influence, SME? it's small and medium-sized enterprise. Right? That is a small business. 
business by comparison. I had a business 20 years ago that was doing £200 million a year. Not Obviously not £500 million, but the, the influence of a Premier League football club is not... Well, it's his brand. It opens doors and it opens relationships and it gets you into rooms and into enclaves and conclaves where you wouldn't get before. And then you've got a different agenda. And it needs, and they're right, the boys, it needs to be watched. But when you start suggesting that you don't like the economics of another league buying players at market value because someone told you that the PIF fund invested in um, uh, Clearview or Clear Lake, whatever they're called, 16 years ago, I think you need to grow up a little bit. Honestly, is my uh, view. Um, do you think if you owned a Premier League club, you'd be slightly worried about the Saudi Arabia rise? No. I'd be not if I owned a Premier League football club. If I owned any football club, as a football fan, as a commentator on football, a commentator on football, as an observer, as someone that's emotionally invested in football, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about the the nature of what it's going to do to hyperinflation. But then again, I am also in the camp that football can grow itself economically. I I, I don't worry so much about the sports washing side of things, or they, and there'll be a sudden intake of breath about the reality of the human rights issues, because some of it clearly I, I, I relate to. Others, I think societies have got to evolve. You know, I made this point before I went to Qatar about who are we in the West to dictate the belief system of other countries. This not so popular, I don't think. Well, I wonder if there's going to be problems on the horizon. You sort of touched on it a little bit earlier on uh, for the Premier League and for Newcastle United, and sort of considering uh, that we were talking about Saudi Arabia just a moment ago, the club's chairman, Yasser al Ramayan, yes. uh, if he accepts the invitation that has been given to him to testify in front of a US Senate committee over the golf merger between PGA and LIV, then it, it would cause quite a stir, wouldn't it? But it's already caused a stir, isn't it? Because he's already admitted in open correspondence in the court case that was going on with LIV in America that he represents a nation state. Well, he tried to get away from testifying by suggesting that he was a representative of the Saudi government. Correct. So with that in mind, and he heads up the PIF fund, the link is... And, and, and by the very same definition, that makes them accountable for the information they've given to the Premier League about the nature of the investment in... The Premier League will point to this ridiculous notion that they've got... Assurances. Uh, assurances. Assurances of what? What assurances have you got? You've got the same personnel. What possible what possible difference is there that you can get assurances from? I tell you, I'm also, not going to do it. it. A bit it's just bloody stupid. A bit of a joke of the fact that the, the assurances they've got apparently hold more weight than the uh, court documents in the United States of America. Well, of course. There's a ridiculousness of it all. And it's interesting that the Americans... Because the Americans will not like this idea. They will not like it at all. Like I said a, a little bit earlier on in the show. And it will become political, won't it? It is political. It absolutely is political now. And if you look at the people that are interrogating it, there is politics in mind here. Um, but the bottom line is, it doesn't alter the fact that there is a pushback, um, with exception for Donald Trump, who thinks that everything Live Golf does, maybe give him an opportunity for one of his golf courses, is good. Um, and, of course, the relationships he has with these sorts of people come under question or, and are debatable at times. But the point is this, is that the Americans don't tend to like this kind of investment strategy. They don't want it. We, on the other hand, in Europe, embrace it. Do we they, embrace do they it. not want it because they want to be in control of these things? Well, they, they, because they consider themselves to be the world's superpower and they're the world's policemen, aren't they? And, and they should decide what been. happens. And they should decide they've got their own economy, their own value sets, their own outlook, their own disposition and their own economic might. And they don't feel necessarily that their major assets and institutions that have great value to the structure of their society should be owned by nation states and influences like nation states. And if you look at the way the Americans do business and the way that their investment in their countries and who the biggest investors are, you find that it's a very different structure to the way that the Europeans uh, solicit or engage investment. Now, with that in mind, it creates... A, it, Masters has created a situation. And, you know, he's not as clever as he thinks he is. This is the chief executive of the Premier League. Yeah, because this is a very difficult... He's got himself a hot potato on his hands now because not only are Saudi... Um, the owners of Newcastle, and he's allowed that to happen, they have now got Qatar coming through the door. And all that goes with that, because if you Qatar are the bid for Manchester United, um, I don't know, with all due respect, many of the Qataris that have this kind of wealth that aren't indexed to the government in Qatar or to the royal family, uh, and they can they can draw as many lines as they want between it, it'll be a, it'll be a state-owned football club again. Yasser al Ramayan has been invited to testify on the 11th of July at the Senate doesn't Permanent mean to, doesn't, doesn't Subcommittee mean on it. Doesn't mean he has to go there, does it? Well, here's the question. If he doesn't go, what happens then? Depends what powers they have to block this transaction. 
I don't know what powers they have to intervene and stop a transaction going forward when commercial enterprises have agreed a, a, have agreed a transaction. Because the transaction is the acquisition of PGA. Guys. I know what it is. Yeah, no, I'm just explaining for the but listener. I but, I, but, I, but I don't know what the legislation says. We've got no legislation in this country that government can intervene and stop the purchase of something um, because football determines its own rule policies. Mm. And as we have seen... We have the, we have Monopolies and Mergers Commission. At yes, but that's about owning one too, to one person having too much influence over, of, of, over something which artificially um, detracts away from the consumer, pretty much, yeah. or from the value of something because you're able to control it. That's why the Monopolies Commission, whenever you do a broadcast deal, whether Sky pitch for a deal, it has to be... It has to go past the monopolies and mergers commissions because otherwise they can set the price and they can control the market and no one else gets any say in it and the consumer ends up with a with a detrimental outcome. Yeah. Um, would the Premier League try to stop him from testifying at this particular hearing? Would they? Would no. Or, or would they? Would they what? discourage really? it? No. Um, well, they've got themselves in a cleft position, aren't they? They, they, you know, people are now looking at it. There are more educated eyes looking at the world globally. And a couple of years ago, this would have flown past, and no one would have seen the situation in uh, in some uh, resistance to testifying or making himself accountable in America because he doesn't feel he has to. Now he's already taken his stance. If he doesn't feel he's got to be part of a court process and doesn't feel that he, because of his position as a member of the royal family or an index of the royal family that he has to be judged by their legal system, he won't feel that he has to be judged by their political one. So, so, so in that case, if that I I is the case. Are we suggesting that actually, you mentioned it would have flown through 10 years ago? We just ago, wouldn't have picked no up one, on it. Yeah. No In the same way no one would have picked up Clear Lake. Actually, and, the and idea that um, he is being discussed, we're discussing this, Jamie Carragher is discussing yeah. this, Gary Neville is discussing this. Actually, is it bringing the issues that Saudi Arabia have with the human rights, with finance, into the public domain and actually yeah. elevating the conversation. Yeah, yeah, of course it brings a discourse, doesn't it? But like everything else in the media, the media lights upon it like a butterfly and then disappears off five minutes later when it's lost its attention span. Now, you know, no one talks about Afghanistan and the withdrawal of Afghanistan anymore because it's run its media cycle. And ultimately, the money and the influence will talk. It's not a bad thing in the here and now to talk about it. It's, a, it's important to talk about it in a grown-up way. Um, so that the noises that are made are taken seriously by people of influence, that they do it in the right fashion. But look at the look at look at they waved in the Saudis. They're waving the Qataris next, and they've got a challenge on their hand because it looks like if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? And th yet that duck was able to get away with buying a football club. Do we undervalue? Because there's no for legislation. A long time? There's no legislation that stopped them from doing it in the first place. Anyway, do we undervalue football for a long time? Do we not how? see? Do we not see? How do we, our companies not see? The investment opportunities, the brand associations that football but could it, give it, that other countries isn't this, isn't have this the now the recognised. Aren't we the inventors of the Harrier jump jets? Aren't we the people that brought such innovation to the world? But very rarely in this country do we actually attach as much value to our own invest, uh, our own um, um, sentiments, ideals, and and in and and creations. And it wasn't so long ago we were prepared to sell the London Stock Exchange. Because that's how we roll, you know, that's how it seems to be in this country. And I, I'm in your camp, but let's also get into context. Some of these football clubs aren't being bought for commercial reasons. They're being bought for influence reasons. You know, a lot, a lot of a lot of accusations were made about Mike Ashley's motivations for buying Newcastle. I had this conversation with him about him and Paul Kemsley. I had a bet about who wouldn't wouldn't buy a football club. So that the reasons why Mike Ashley bought Newcastle, allegedly according to Paul Kemsley, is because they had a bet about that he wouldn't. Um, and then he used it for an influence play because he used it to leverage his sports brands. Got his money back in the end. Um, but the, the the nature of football is now a conduit and a gatekeeper for so many things, whether it's influence, whether it's agendas, whether it's activism. And, you know, sooner or later, it should be just about sport rather than let's have this cause, let's have this influence, let's have this sports washing, or oh, let's have a side order of sport as well whilst we're about it. Yeah.